Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga gaming episode. This is the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons episode where I read the Dungeon Master's Guide in this particular series. Now, it is Braca Dark Ember the 13th. My name is Adam. Dragonlance came out of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, so I thought it would be fun to read the core rules aloud and discuss them with a live audience. I'd like to take a moment and thank the members of this channel and invite you to consider becoming a member. You can also pick up Dragonlance gaming materials using my affiliate link. Both links are in the description below. So we left off on this with the thief abilities. So I'm just going to pick up right there where we left off. Of course, I got to get my notes here so I can write down timestamps for future reference in case you guys want to, you know, skip to specific parts of it later on. Thief abilities. The following additional explanation of thief abilities will help you to prevent abuse of these activities by thieves and other characters able to use these abilities in whole or in part in your campaign. Roll of the dice for any thief function must be kept absolutely secret so the thief or similar character does not know the results. Backstabbing. Opponents aware of the thief will be able to negate the attack form. Certain creatures, otugs, slimes, molds, etc. either negate surprise or have no definable back, <laughs> thus negating the ability. Pickpockets. Failure allows additional attempts. The victim might notice and allow the thief to operate anyway in order to track him or her back to the place he or she uses as a headquarters. Up to two attempts at picking a pocket can be made during a round. Opening locks. The act of picking the lock to be opened can take from one to ten rounds, depending on the complexity of the lock. As a rule, most locks will take but one to four rounds of time to pick. Finding and removing traps. Use the time requirements for opening locks. Time, and time counts for each, fu each function. Small or large traps can be found, but not magical or magically hidden traps. Move silently. Silent movement is the same as normal exploratory movement, i.e. 12 feet per round as the thief creeps up, crudles, upon the area or victim or whatever. Do not inform the thief that his or her dice score indicated a lack of success at this attempted stealth, if that is the case. He or she thinks the movement is silent, and the monster or other victim will inform the character of his or her misapprehension soon enough. Hide in shadows. As is plainly stated in Player's Handbook, this is never possible under direct or even indirect observation. If the thief insists on trying, allow the th attempt and throw dice, but don't bother to read them, as the fool is as obvious as a coal pile in a ballroom. <laughs> what? Likewise, if a hidden thief attempts movement while under observation, the proverbial jig is up for him or her. Naturally, a creature closely pressed in melee is not likely to bother with looking for some thief not directly in the line of sight. But if vision would normally extend to the thief's area of activity, then observation rules apply. Unobserved attempts to hide in shadows must likewise stand the hazard of the dice roll. A score greater than the required number shows that the character's ability is not on par with his or her intent, and although he or she thinks hiding has been successful, the creature looking in that direction will note a suspicious outline, form, or whatever. Note also that a thief hiding in shadows is still subject to detection just as if he or she was invisible. See Invisibility, Detection of Invisibility table. I love that idea that you think you're hiding and the people are just staring right at you. Like, I can see you. No, no, you can't. I'm hiding. No, you're talking to me. I can see you. You're right there. And he just points at him. Nope, you can't see me. Hearing noise. This is pretty straightforward. The thief, just as any other character, must take off helmet or other obstructing headgear in order to press his or her ear to the door surface in order to hear beyond. Climbing walls. This is probably the most abused thief function, although hiding in shadows vies for its distinction. The ability to climb walls is something which is acquired through training and practice, just as are most of the other functions of the thief. The rate at which vertical or horizontal movement is possible depends upon the texture and other conditions of the surface. And we've got a bit of a wall climbing table here. You can see the wall surface and the varying degrees of roughness or smoothness and the condition of the surface, whether it's slippery or not, and the amount of you know, uh, distance they can travel. 
So slightly slippery surface double chances of slipping and falling. Slippery surfaces make chances of slipping and falling 10 times more likely. Thus, a slippery surface cannot be attempted successfully by any thief under 6th level. And even a 10th level thief has a 10% chance per round of slipping and falling. That's pretty cool. Be certain to check each round of vertical or horizontal movement for chance of slipping and falling. Surfaces which are inclined inwards move towards greater degrees of difficulty, a non-slippery one being treated as slightly slippery, and a slippery one being virtually unclimbable. Surfaces inclined away from the perpendicular or on an outward angle may be treated as either a better surface condition or rougher texture, if the degree of incline is sufficient to make climbing easier. Most dungeon walls will fall into the fairly rough to rough category. Some will be non-slippery, but most will be slightly slippery due to dampness and slime growth. Read languages. This ability assumes that the language is, in fact, one which the thief has encountered sometime in the past. Ancient and strange languages, those you as DM have previously designated as such, are always totally unreadable. Even if able to read a language, the thief should be allowed only to get about that percentage of the meaning of what is written as his or her percentage ability to read the tongue in the first place. The rest, they will have to guess at. Languages which are relatively close to those known by the thief will not incur such a penalty. I actually really love these clarifications about the thief's abilities because, honestly, thieves can be really OP without these restrictions attached to them you know being able to read any language being able to climb any wall being able to you know sneak up and hide anywhere uh it's important to have the downside to it as well and here's the other thing i have never actually hidden the role i've always allowed the thief to roll their own abilities never the dm so this is a new one to me uh that i've just never really done and i guess it speaks to whether or not you trust your players and whether or not they're hiding their roles to see whether or not the thief can actually do what they're claiming to be able to do, you know? So anyway, interesting. Thieves and Assassins Setting Traps Simple mechanical traps can be set by thieves or assassins. The chance to do so successfully is equal to that of the chance shown for detecting such traps. But in this case, the assassin operates at an ability level equal to two levels above his or her own, and exactly as if he or she were a thief. E.g., a 5th level assassin has the same chance of setting a trap as a 7th level thief does. Simple traps are those which involve mechanical components, which the character setting them has normal access to, such as arrow traps, trip wires, and spring-propelled missiles. Special devices such as poisoned needles, scything blades, and any similar trap with special mechanical components will also require the effort of one or more specialists, those required to manufacture the component parts. Whenever a thief or assassin character desires to set a trap, require him or her to fur furnish you a simple drawing to illustrate how the trap will function. If the chance to successfully set the trap results in failure, there is a chance of causing injury to the trap setter, just as if he or she had set off such a trap. This chance of rolling for separately and is the obverse of the chance of for success setting of a trap. Drawing of the trap will modify the chances for injury in cases where failure results. Modification can be upwards and downwards according to the complexity and danger of the trap. Note that even with a prepared mechanism for a poison needle, for example, the trap must be set and failure can result. Gloves or protective headwear cannot be worn when setting traps. Whoa. <laughs> Why did my watch think I... Just started a workout. That's strange. Finally, failure on the first attempt to set a trap does not mean that the thief or assassin can never set the trap. Unlike other similar thief functions, repeated attempts are permissible. Assassination experience points. An assassin re receives 100 experience points per level of the character assassinated, minus or plus 50 experience points for every level the assassin is greater or lesser than his or her victim. This is modified by multipliers for the degree of difficulty of the mission. Simple X1 half, difficulty X1 or extraordinary X1 and a half. These explanations for difficulty given under spying should be used as guidelines here. 
The experience given above is added to the regular experience earned for killing the victim, as if he or she were a monster. Experience is also given for the fee the assassin is paid. Therefore, if an 8th level assassin snuck up on and surprised a 10th level magic user in a dungeon and successfully assassinated him, the assassin would receive 1000 XP plus another 100 XP since the magic user was 2 levels higher than he. However, since it was a simple mission, the total 1100 XP would be multiplied by one half, giving 550 points. This is added to the 2,400 experience normally received for killing this magic user, making the final total of 2,950 experience earned, exclusive of fees. Assassin's Use of Poison Assassins use poison just as any other character does, according to the dictates of the DM. That is, they use the normal tables for poison types, QV. When an assassin reaches 9th level, assassin, he or she may opt to make a study of poisons. This decision should come from the player in the case of a player character, i.e., do not suggest it or even intimate that it's such a study can be undertaken. The study will require many weeks at a cost from 2,000 to 8,000 gold pieces per week. The assassin must find a mentor, an assassin who has already made a, such a study and actually has put the techniques into practice. In most cases, this will be a non-playing character assassin of 12th level or higher, who will charge the variable amount. The cost reflects both time and the poisons used in the training. If a playing character is involved, he or she must actually have a wide variety of animal, vegetable, and mineral poisons on hand for the training, but he or she can also set the fee as he or she sees fit. It is not the place of this work to actually serve as a manual for poisons and poisoning. Not only is such a subject distasteful, but it would not properly mesh with the standard poison system used herein. Therefore, the assassin must spend five to eight weeks to learn each of the following poison skills. Proper use of all poisons effective in the bloodstream only. Proper use of poisons effective through ingestion only. Proper use of contact poisons and poisons effective when in the bloodstream or ingested. The manufacture of poisons and their antidotes. Thus, after 20 to 32 weeks of study, the assassin will have complete knowledge of 90% of all poisons known. He or she can then use poisons at full normal effect and have the following options as well. Choose to assassinate by an instantaneous poison. Elect to use a slow-acting poison which will not begin to affect the victim for one to four hours after ingestion. Elect to use a poison which gradually builds up after repeated doses and kills one to ten days after the final dose. The assassin must compound the poison, of course. The DM will have to adjudicate this manufacture as he or she deems best. To simulate such manufacture, it is suggested that a week of time and a relatively small outlay, 200 to 1,200 gold pieces for materials, bribes, etc., suffice for any poison. Instantaneous and very slow, undetectable poisons should be more time-consuming and costly, but not greatly so. This does not guarantee the assassin's success, naturally, for he or she must still manage the poison and then escape. However, it will give a far better chance, and also provide leverage with regard to a slow poison by knowing the antidote. Note that the assassin can stop his or her study at any point, knowing only the knowledge gained in the completed course of study. Also, during any course of study, the assassin may not engage in any other activity, for he or she must begin studying again from the beginning of the course. This means that during from five to eight game weeks, the assassin character will be out of play. The one type of poison which assassins can learn to compound is blade venom. Blade venom always an incinitive poison, see poison types, evaporates quickly, but the first day after its application, it does full damage. The second day, half, and by the third day, none. It is likewise removed by use. On the first hit, it will do full damage. On the second hit, half damage. And by the third, it will be gone. Partially evaporating or used death poisons allow the victim a plus four on his or her saving throw. Poison types. The poison of monsters, regardless of its pluses or minuses to the victim's saving throw, is an all or nothing affair. That is, either they do no damage or they kill the victim within a minute or so. 
Poison potions generally do the same, although you may optionally select to have any given one be slow acting, so that the victim will notice nothing for one to ten hours after quaffing it. Monsters' poisons are all effective by either ingestion or insinuation into the body and bloodstream of the victim. Poison potions must be ingested. If you allow poison used by characters in your campaign, users can purchase ingestive or insinuative poisons only, having to obtain dual-use poisons from monsters. Purchased poisons are classified and priced as follows. So you can see the poison type, A through E, the cost, which can get pretty expensive, the onset of time, damage if saved, and damage if not saved. And some uh, notes here is saving throw at plus four, chance of taste, smelling, seeing poison 80%, saving throw at plus three, chance of tasting, smelling, seeing poison 65%. Oh, we got an image here I gotta show you. This is great. All right, is it kobold or is it cobbled? I gotta know. Cause I always say kobold, but my son said cobbled, Derek said cobbled, I just don't know what's true. <laughs> my whole, Kobold world has been turned upside down. I like seeing this dragon just tearing him up, though. That's funny. Assassins use all forms of poison, and other than those listed above, add an efficiency, which gives the victim plus one on the saving throw. All other character types use them at an efficiency level, which allows the victim plus two on saves in all cases. Assassins who have studied poisoning have no penalty. See Assassin's Use of Poisons. The monster as a player character. On occasion, one player or another will evidence a strong desire to operate as a monster. Conceiving a playable character as a strong demon, a devil, a dragon, or one of the most powerful sorts of undead creatures. This is done principally because player sees the desired monster character as a superior to his or her peers and likely to provide a dominant role for him or her in the campaign. A moment of reflection will bring them to the unalterable conclusion that the game is heavily weighted towards mankind. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons is unquestionably humanocentric, with demi-humans, semi-humans, and humanoids in various orbits around the sun of humanity. Men are the worst monsters, particularly high-level characters such as clerics, fighters, and magic users whether singly or in small groups or in large companies. The ultra-powerful beings of other planes are more fearsome. The three Ds of demigods, demons, and devils are enough to strike fear into most characters, let alone when the very gods themselves are brought into consideration. Yet, there is a point where the well-equipped, high-level party of adventurers can challenge a demon prince, an arch-devil, or a demigod. While there might well be some near or part humans with the group so doing, it is certain that the leaders will be human. In cooperation, men bring ruin upon monsterdom, for they have no upper limits as to level or acquired power from spells or items. The game features humankind for a reason. It is the most logical basis in an illogical game. From a design aspect, it provides the sound groundwork. From a standpoint of creating the campaign milieu, it provides the most readily usable assumptions. From a participation approach, it is the only method for all players are, after all is said and done, human, and it allows them the role with which most are most desirous and capable of identifying with. From all views, then, it is enough fantasy to assume a swords and sorcery cosmos with impossible professions and make-believe magic, to adventure amongst the weird is fantasy enough without becoming that, too. Consider also that each and every dungeon master worthy of that title is continually at work expanding his or her campaign milieu. The game is not a merely meaningless dungeon and an urban base around which is plopped the dreaded wilderness. Each of you must design a world, piece by piece, as if a jigsaw puzzle were being handcrafted, and each new section must fit perfectly the pattern of the other pieces. Faced with such a task, all of these need all of the aid and assistance we can get. Without such help, the sheer magnitude of the task would force most of us to throw up our hands in despair. By having a basis to work from, 
and a well-developed body of work to draw upon, at least part of this task is handled for us. When history, folklore, myth, fable, and fiction can be incorporated or used as reference for the campaign, the magnitude of the effort required is reduced by several degrees. Even actual sciences can be used, geography, chemistry, physics, and so forth. Alien viewpoints can be found, of course, but not in quantity, and often not in much quality either. Those works which do not feature mankind in a central role are uncommon. Those which do not deal with men at all are scarce indeed. To attempt to utilize any such basis as the central, let alone sole, theme for a campaign milieu is destined to be shallow, incomplete, and totally unsatisfying for all parties concerned, unless the creator is a renaissance man and all-around universal genius with a decade or two to prepare the game and milieu. Even then, how can such an effort rival one which borrows from the talents of genius and imaginative thinking which came to us from literature? Having established the why of the humanocentric basis of the game, you will certainly see the impossibility of any lasting success for a monster player character. The environment for adventuring will be built around humans and demi-humans for the most part. Similarly, the majority of participants in the campaign will be human. So unless the player desires a character which will lurk alone somewhere and be hunted by adventurers, there are only a few options open to him or her. A gold dragon can assume human shape, so that's a common choice for monster characters. If alignment is stressed, this might discourage the would-be gold dragon. If it is also pointed out that he or she must begin at the lowest level possible, and only time in the accumulation and retention of great masses of wealth will allow any increase in level, age, the idea should be properly squelched. If even that fails, point out that the natural bent of dragons is certainly for their own kind, if not absolute solitude. So what part could a solitary dragon play in a group participation game made up of non-dragons? Dragon non-playing characters, yes, as player characters, not likely at all. As to other sorts of monsters as player characters, you as DM must decide in light of your aims and the style of your campaign. The considered opinion of this writer is that such characters are not beneficial to the game and should be excluded. Note that exclusion is best handled by restriction and not by refusal. Enumeration of the limits and drawbacks which are attendant upon the monster character will always be sufficient to steer the intelligent player away from monster approach, for in most cases it was only thought of as a likely manner of game domina uh, domination. The truly experimental type player might be allowed to play such a character monster, uh, monster character for a time so as to satisfy curiosity, and it can then be moved to non-player status and still be an interesting part of the campaign. And the player is most likely to desire to drop the monster character once he or she has examined its potential and played that role for a time. The less intelligent players who demand to play monster characters regardless of obvious consequences will soon remove themselves from play in any event, for their own ineptness will serve to have players or monsters or traps finish them off. So, you are virtually on your own with regard to monsters as player characters. You have advice as to why they're not featured, why no details of monster character classes are given herein. The rest is up to you, for when all is said and done, it is your world, and your players must live in it with their characters. Be good to yourself as well as them, and everyone concerned will benefit from a well-conceived, well-ordered, fairly judged campaign built upon the best of imaginative and creative thinking. All right, we are on our next section here. Lycanthropy. There have been many different approaches to the disease of lycanthropy. Many are too complicated to understand or are structured so poorly that the were creature dominates the game. Lycanthropy as a form of player character should be discouraged in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. This can be done by promoting the human attributes instead of the beasts, thus making lycanthropy undesirable as it should be. Some players may not realize that any damage over 50% of hit points sustained by bites in a fight with a lycanthrope may cause them to be afflicted by the disease. When this happens, it may be months after the first night of the change before the character begins to suspect that lycanthropy has taken hold of his or her being. After that first night, all that will be remembered is that the character was very ill and extremely tired. 
In the morning, the townspeople will quite possibly be combing the countryside looking for a rampaging lycanthrope. The player and character may join in the search for the werebeast, not realizing that he or she is the lycanthrope. After a few months of changing, the adventurer will, or should, begin to suspect that something is wrong. On the nights before the full moon, the lycanthrope will become withdrawn and a bit edgy, preferring his or her own company to that of others, including family. It may be torn in shredded clothes he or she wakes up in, in the mud and scratches in the character's arms and legs that trigger the realization that he or she may be the werebeast the townspeople are searching for. If at all possible, the DM should try to moderate the campaign so that the players don't know for several months of game time that the character is now a lycanthrope. Any human players, humans are the only beings able to conduct lycan lyca <laughs> lycanthropy, Bitten, for 50% or more of his or her natural hit points, has a 100% chance of becoming a lycanthrope for the same type that attacked him or her. If the player eats any belladonna within an hour after being bitten, there is a 25% chance the disease will not manifest itself, and thus the character will not be afflicted by it. If not, then a 12th level or higher level patriarch must be found to administer a cure disease within three days after being bitten. If the adventurer is only able to find a patriarch of a high enough level after the initial three days, he or she may elect instead to have the priest attempt a remove curse. This spell must be performed on the player character where he or she is in wear form. The beast will need to make a monster's saving throw against magic, and while in wear form, the creature will fight violently to put as much distance as it can between it and the patriarch performing the spell. If all else fails, there is still hope. At this point, if the player wishes to remain a lycanthrope, the two charts given later should be consulted in handling the lycanthrope as a player character. If the adventurer decides to be cured, and the method mentioned thus far have been unsuccessful, he or she may take refuge in a holy, unholy place, such as a monastery or an abbey. There, the cleric can administer to the afflicted one holy or unholy water laced with a goodly amount of wolfsbane and belladonna prepared by the spiritual method of that particular religion. This potation is to be consumed by the victim at least twice a day from a silver chalice. No adventuring may be done by the character while he or she is being treated by the clerics. After a month or more, depending upon how advanced the disease is, the player and character should be cured and somewhat poorer in the purse, as this procedure is very costly. The clerics will charge for the cost of the herbs and the holy or unholy water as well as for the services rendered. The DM may also wish to include level of the priest as well as the adventure into the cost of this treatment. If the character has died in a fight with a lycanthrope and is resurrected, the disease will be 100% certain if the cleric raising the adventure is unaware of the disease, or fails to follow the proper procedure to eradicate it. The aforementioned cure will work on the wear-stricken adventurer who has been resurrected. The cleric can use a cure disease, if there is still time, or a remove curse, if there isn't, on the dead adventurer before employing the resurrection spell. If the cleric doesn't take the above safety measures, then it will be necessary to wait until the adventurer becomes a lycanthrope to try to remove curse or use the curse with the herbs and holy or unholy water. If the character opts to remain a lycanthrope, many things will need to be taken into consideration, such as the mental anguish caused by the act of changing. Other things like conflicting alignments between the character and his or her lycanthropic nature, and what his or her family and friends will do once they discover that the friend and loved one is the werebeast that might have been terrorizing the countryside on the nights of the full moon, will have to be determined. The more the ex uh, extreme the difference in the alignments of the adventure and the beast, the more mental anguish the character will be prone to suffer. For example, a lawful good paladin is bitten by a werewolf, which is a chaotic evil creature. He doesn't discover that he uh, has the disease until it's too late. His mental torment is great, especially when the moon is waxing full, up to the time it is full and then for several days afterwards. The DM may wish to select a mental disorder from the section on insanity for the character to suffer from to reflect the effects of the anguish caused by the disease. The paladin, even after being cured, is no longer a paladin because he's no longer pure enough for that honored state. The DM can elect to have the gods send the paladin on a quest in order to restore him 
to his paladinhood, but it is not recommended. No experience points may be gained by a playing character while in lycanthropic form. If the character is a fighter or lycanthrope, the fighter will be able to gain levels only as a fighter, never as a lycanthrope. This applies to all classes. The only way a lycanthrope can ever be able to control the change from man to beast is with time measured by full moons. There will be no contact of the change into a werebeast for two years of game time, and it will be another year before any control will be gained for the change back into a human. On the nights of a full moon, all lycanthropes with less than three years experience as a werebeast will change into their were form and remain that way from the, risen, uh, from the rise of the moon till dawn. There are other factors besides the full moon that can cause the release of the were creature in a person afflicted with the lycanthropy. One common cause is stress during a melee. If the character has lost more than one third of his or her natural hit points during the fight, there is a 50% chance that the... Um, Oh, where is it? <laughs> There's a 50% chance that the where nature will emerge, causing the player character to be disoriented for one to two rounds. Characters with more than two years of experience as a lycanthrope will not suffer this disorientation. During this time, the lycanthrope will be unable to engage in combat. He or she will also sustain damage from the change as shown on the appropriate table given below. Spells used in the vicinity of a lycanthrope, such as Monster Summoning 3 or through uh, seven, conjure animals and animal summoning three might cause the wear nature to be released. It will be up to the DM to decide what spell or magic items could trigger the beast inside the afflicted adventurer. Arguments with other player and characters as well as fear could cause the change from man to beast. All lycanthropes will fight and do damage as described in the monster manual, regardless of how long the character has been a lycanthrope. The diseased adventure will eventually acquire the alignment of the lycanthrope form, if it isn't the same already, within 2 to 12 months. While in wear form, the character will not be interested in any of his or her belongings, and will leave them where the change took place. This includes armor and weapons, except for wear rats, who will carry swords. Wear bears are the most powerful form of lycanthrope. As with most lycanthropes, they will eventually flee to the woods. Once a werebear engages in combat with a creature of an evil alignment, it will fight until it or its opponent is dead. 75% of the time, if a monster with an evil alignment is encountered, the werebear will attack immediately. Werebores are the most foul-tempered of the lycanthropes. Their temperament is such that they will not join a party unless they can be the leader. If they do join one and are not its leader, they will argue bitterly with anyone who disagrees with them. This action may cause them to change into their wear form from the stress involved in the argument. Where rats will want to live in the city near humans, humans being one of their favorite foods. If a human is captured and not eaten immediately, it will probably be held for ransom. A were-rat will do all it can to keep the party it is with from discovering that it is a lycanthrope. Were-rats are the only lycanthropes that will carry a sword or use any kind of a weapon while in animal form. When the marching order of a party is being decided, a were-rat will almost always volunteer to be in the rear. Were-tigers are usually interested only in what benefits them. They will tolerate other cats to a certain extent and perhaps even have one for a companion. In human form, where tigers can be mistaken for magic users, for they have a domestic cat for an apparent familiar. For this reason, many in advanced Dungeons and Dragons will disguise themselves as a magic user, possibly taking up a trade just enough to give the facade uh, an appearance of realism. Where tigers might have no qualms about turning on their party if the party begins to behave in a manner that the were tiger finds incompatible with its desires. Where wolves are chaotic evil and therefore very unpredictable, especially in a melee. Werewolves tend to run in packs or family units. Seldom will they join a normal party of adventurers, and if they do, once discovered as a lycanthrope, they will turn and attack the party, usually choosing to do so when the adventurers are in combat with another monster. Change table for lycanthropes. This table will aid the DM determining the percentage chances of a player character lycanthrope change into and out of wear form. 
After six years of experience, lycanthropes will be able to control their change at will. And we have our table here. And it shows the phase of the moon, whether it's want, uh, wanting or waxing, in the amount of years in your percentage. And then below, we have damage table. This table shows how much damage a character takes from armor constriction before the strap bursts and it falls off during sudden change to lycanthropic form. And it shows the type of armor and the type of lycanthrope. It's kind of interesting. All right, and that is the end of that section. So what I just realized is I don't have my text here, which is strange. Alignment. Alignment describes the broad ethos of thinking, reasoning creatures, those unintelligent sorts being placed within the neutral area because they are totally uncaring. Note that alignment does not necessarily dictate religious persuasion, although many religious beliefs will dictate alignment. As explained under Alignment Languages, QV, this aspect of alignment is not the major consideration. The overall behavior of the character or creature is delineated by alignment, or in the case of player characters, behavior determines actual alignment. Therefore, besides defining the general tendencies of creatures, it also groups creatures into mutually acceptable, or at least non-hostile, divisions. This is not to say that groups of similarly aligned creatures cannot be opposed or even mortal enemies. Two nations, for example, with rulers of lawful good alignment can be at war. Bands of orcs can hate each other, but the former would possibly cease the war to oppose a massive invasion of orcs, just as the latter would make common cause against the lawful good men. Thus, alignment describes the worldview of creatures and helps to define what their actions, reactions, and purposes will be. It is likewise causes a playing character to choose an ethos which is appropriate to his or her profession, and alignment also aids players in the definition and role approach of their respective game persona. With the usefulness of alignment determined, definitions of the division is necessary. Major definitions. There are two major definitions of four opposite points of view. All four are not mutually exclusive, although each pair is mutually opposed. Law and Chaos The opposition here is between organized groups and individuals. That is, law dictates that order and organization is necessary and desirable, while chaos holds to the opposite view. Law generally supports the group as more important than the individual, while chaos promotes the individual over the group good and evil. Basically stated, the tenets of good are human rights, or in the cases of advanced Dungeons and Dragons, creature rights. Each creature is entitled to life, relative freedom, and the prospect of happiness. Cruelty and suffering are undesirable. Evil, on the other hand, does not concern itself with rights or happiness. Purposes is the determinant. There can never exist a lawful chaos or an evil good. These and their reverses are dichotomies. This is not to say that they cannot exist in the same character or creature if it is insane or controlled by another entity, but as general divisions, they are mutually exclusive pairs. Consider also the alignment graph. If law is opposed to chaos and good to evil, then the radically opposed alignments are lawful neutral, chaos, chaotic neutral, neutral good and neutral evil, lawful good and chaotic evil, and lawful evil and chaotic good. Lawful groups might, for example, combine to put down some chaotic threat, for example, just as readily as good groups would combine to suppress some powerful evil. Basic understanding and agreement, however, is within the general specific alignment, i.e., one of the nine categories. These are defined as follows. Neutrality. Absolute or true neutral creatures view everything which exists as an integral necessary part or function of the entire cosmos. Each thing exists as a part of the whole, one as a check or balance to the other with life necessary for death, happiness for suffering, good for evil, order for chaos, and vice versa. Nothing must uh, ever become predominant or out of balance. Within this naturalistic ethos, humankind serves a role also, just as all other creatures do. 
They may be more or less important, but the neutral does not concern himself or herself with these considerations, except where it is positively determined that the balance is threatened. Absolute neutrality is in the center or fulcrum position, quite logically, as the neutral sees all other alignments as parts of a necessary whole. This alignment is the narrowest in scope. Neutral good, creatures of this alignment see the cosmos as a place where law and chaos are merely tools to use in bringing life, happiness, and prosperity to all deserving creatures. Order is not good unless it brings this to all. Neither is randomness and total freedom desirable if it does not bring such good. Neutral evil. Similar to the neutral good alignment, that of neutral evil holds that neither groups nor individuals have great meaning. This ethos holds that seeking to promote weal for all actually brings woe to the truly deserving. Natural forces which are meant to cull out the weak and stupid are artificially suppressed by so-called good, and the fittest are wrongfully held back. So whatever means are expedient can be used by the powerful to gain and maintain their dominance without concern for anything. Lawful Good Creatures of lawful, good alignment view the cosmos with varying degrees of lawfulness or desire for good. They are convinced that order and law are absolutely necessary to assure good, and that good is best defined as whatever brings the most benefit to the greater number of decent-thinking creatures and the least woe to the rest. Lawful Neutral It is the view of this alignment that law and order give purpose and meaning to everything. Without regimentation and strict definition, there would be no purpose in the cosmos. Therefore, whether a law is good or evil is of no import, as long as it brings order and meaning. Lawful Evil Obviously, all order is not good, nor are all laws beneficial. Lawful evil creatures consider order as the means by which each group is properly placed in the cosmos, from lowest to highest, strongest first, weakest last. Good is seen as an excuse to promote the mediocrity of the whole and suppress the better and more capable, while law, evilness, allows each group to structure itself and fix its place as compared to others, serving the stronger but being served by the weaker. Chaotic Good To the chaotic good individual, freedom and independence are as important to life and happiness. The ethos view this freedom as the only means by which each creature can achieve true satisfaction and happiness. Law, order, social forms, and anything else which tends to restrict or abridge individual freedom is wrong, and each individual is capable of achieving self-realization and prosperity through himself, herself, or itself. Chaotic Neutral This view of the cosmos holds that absolute freedom is necessary, whether the individual exercising such freedom chooses to do good or evil is of no concern. After all, life itself is law and order, so death is a desirable end. Therefore, life can only be justified as a tool by which order is combated, and in the end, it too will pass into entropy. Chaotic Evil The chaotic evil creature holds that individual freedom and chaotic uh, and choice is important, and that other individuals and their freedoms are unimportant if they cannot be held by the individual through their own strengths and merit. Thus, law and order tends to promote not individuals, but groups, and groups suppress individual volition and success. And we can show a little image here. These are great. I love these little line drawings. There is no honor among thieves. Each of these cases for alignment is, of course, stated rather simplistically and ideally, for philosophical and moral reasoning are completely subjective according to the acculturation of the individual. You, as Dungeon Master, must establish the meaning and boundaries of law and order as opposed to chaos and anarchy, as well as the divisions between right and good as opposed to hurtful and evil. Lawful societies will tend to be highly structured, rigid, well-policed, and bureaucratic hierarchical. Class, rank, position, and precedence will be important, so they will be strictly defined and adhered to. On the other hand, chaotic areas will have little government and few social distinctions. The governed will give their consent to government, acknowledging leaders as equals serving those who allowed them to assume leadership, obedience, and service in a chaotic society is given only by those desiring to do so, or by dint of some persuasion, never by requirement. 
alignment with respect to the planes. Obviously, the material planes have no set alignment, nor do the other inner planes or the ethereal or astral ones either. However, the outer planes show various alignments. This is because they are home to creatures who are of like general alignment. If the curves of the alignment table are carried outwards to the planes, only those planes at the corners will correspond to non-neutral alignments, i.e. lawful good, chaotic good, chaotic evil, and lawful evil. Similarly, those on the horizontal and vertical axes correspond to the neutral base alignments, which support an ethos, i.e. neutral good, chaotic neutral, neutral evil, and lawful neutral. The remainder of the outer planes areas are gray areas where alignments shade into each other. Uninhabitants, I'm sorry, inhabitants of these planes will generally have the same worldview as their fellows on the prime material plane. Graphing alignment. It is of importance to keep track of player characters' behavior with respect to their professed alignments. Actions do speak far more eloquently than the professions, and each activity of a playing character should reflect his or her alignment. If a professed lawful evil character is consistently seeking to be helpful and is respecting the lesser creatures, he or she is certainly tending towards good, while if he or she ignores regulations and constant. Uh, consistent behavior, the trend is towards chaotic alignments. See Player's Handbook, Appendix 3, Character Alignment Graph. Such drift should be noted by you, and when it takes the individual into a new alignment area, you should then inform the player that his or her character has changed alignment. See Changing Alignment. It is quite possible for a character to drift around in an alignment area, making only small shifts due to behavior. However, any major action which is out of alignment character will cause a major shift to the alignment which is directly in line with the action, i.e., if a lawful evil character defies the law in order to aid the cause, expressed or implied, of chaotic good, he or she will be either lawful neutral or chaotic neutral, depending on those factors involved in the action. It is of utmost importance to keep rigid control of alignment behavior with respect to such characters as serve deities who will accept only certain alignments, those who are paladins, those who with evil familiars, and so on. Part of the role they have accepted requires a set behavior mode, and its benefits are balanced by this. Therefore, failure to demand strict adherence to alignment behavior is to allow a game obtuse. I'm sorry, <laughs> abuse. Lawful good characters should not be allowed to ignore unlawful or shady actions by looking the other way. If, for example, a party that includes a paladin decides to use poison on a monster that they know is ahead, the DM shouldn't let the paladin be distracted or led away for a few rounds when it is patient, uh, patently obvious that the paladin heard the plan. If the player does not take appropriate measures to prevent the action, the DM should warn the paladin that his lack of action will constitute a voluntary alignment change and then let the chips fall where they may. Alignment Language Alignment language is a handy game tool which is not unjustifiable in real terms. Thieves did employ a special cant. Secret organizations and societies did and do have certain recognition symbols, signs, signals, and recognition phrases, possibly special languages of limited extent as well. Consider also the medieval Catholic Church, which used Latin as a common recognition and communication base to cut across national boundaries. In Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, alignment language are the special set of signs, signals, gestures, and words which intelligent creatures use to inform other intelligent creatures of the same alignment of their fellowship and common ethos. Alignment languages are never flaunted in public. They are not used as salutations or interrogatives. If the speaker is uncertain of the alignment of those addressed. Furthermore, alignment languages are of limited vocabulary and deal with the ethos of the alignment in general, so lengthy discussion of varied subjects cannot be conducted in such tongues. Each alignment language is constructed to allow recognition of like-aligned creatures and to discuss the precepts of the alignment in detail. Otherwise, the tongue will permit only the most rudimentary communication with a vocabulary limited to a few score words. The speaker could inquire of the listener's state of health, ask about hunger, thirst, or degree of tiredness. 
A few other basic conditions and opinions could be expressed, but no more. The specialty tongues of Druidic and the Thieves' Cant are designed to handle conversations pertaining to things Druidical, on the one hand, and thievery, robbing, and the disposal of stolen goods on the other. Druids could discuss at length and in detail the state of the crops, weather, animal husbandry, and forestry, but well, warfare, politics, adventuring, and like matter would be impossible to detail with the language. Any character foolish enough to announce his or her alignment by publicly crying out that the alignment tongue will incur considerable social sanctions. At best, he or she will be thought unmannerly, rude, boorish, and stupid. Those of the same alignment will be inclined to totally ignore the character, not wishing to embarrass themselves by admitting any familiarity with the offender. Those of other alignments will likewise regard the speaker with distaste when overhearing such an outburst. At worst, the character will be marked by those hostile to the alignment in which he or she spoke. Alignment language is used to establish credentials only after initial communications have been established by other means. Only in the most desperate of situations would any creature utter something in the alignment tongue otherwise. It, mu uh, it must also be noted that alignments does not necessarily empower a creature to actually speak or understand the alignment language which is generally in the ethos. Thus, blinking dogs are intelligent, lawful good creatures who have a language of their own. A lawful good human, dwarf, or brownie will be absolutely at a loss to communicate with blink dogs. However, except in the most limited of ways, non-aggression, non-fear, etc. Without knowledge of the creature's language or some magical means. This is because blink dogs do not intellectually embrace the ethos of lawful good, but are that of alignment instinctually. Therefore, they do not speak the tongue used by lawful good. This is not true of gold dragons. Let us say, or red dragons with respect to their alignment, who do speak their respective alignment languages. Changing alignment. Whether or not the character actively professes some deity, he or she will have an alignment and serve one or more deities of this general alignment indirectly and unbeknownst to the character. Changing of alignment is a serious matter, although some players would have their characters change alignment as often as they change socks. Not so. First, change of alignment for clerics can be very serious, as it might cause a change of deity. See day-to-day -day acquisition of cleric spells. If a druid changes his or her alignment, that is because other than neutral, then he or she is no longer a druid at all. Change of alignment will have an adverse effect on any class of character he or she is above um, if he or she is above the second level. Immediately upon alignment chains actually occurring, the character concerned will lose one level of experience, dropping experience points to take him or her to the very beginning of the next lower level, losing the hit die and or hit points and all abilities with accrued to him or her with the lost level. If the alignment change is involuntary, such as that caused by a powerful magic, a curse, etc., then the character can regain all of the losses, level, hit die, etc., upon returning to his or her former alignment as soon as is possible and after making atonement through a cleric of the same alignment, and sacrificing treasure, which is a value of not less than 10,000 gold pieces per level of experience of the character. The sacrificial amount is variable, so use your best judgment as to the total and what and where it should go. Magic items to build up the NPC cleric, money out of the campaign, magic items out of the campaign, etc. Similarly, such atonement and sacrifice can be accomplished by a quest. Note that, in all likelihood, the character will desire to retain the new alignment, and it is incumbent upon you as the DM to ensure that the player acts accordingly. Some equally powerful means, divin divine intervention, remove curse, etc., must be used to restore the original alignment before atonement can begin. Characters who knowingly or unknowingly change alignment through forethought or actions permanently lose their experience points and level due to disfavor. They must also accept a severe disability in alignment language during a one-level transitional period until the character has again achieved his or her former level of experience held prior to change of alignment. He or she will not be able to converse in the former alignment's tongue, nor will anything but the rudest signaling be possible in the new alignment language. See Alignment Language. Although it is possible for a character to allow him or herself to be blown by the winds as far as alignment is concerned, he or she will pay a penalty, 
which will be effectively damn the character to oblivion. A glance at the alignment chart will show that radical alignment change is impossible without magical means. If one is chaotic good, it is possible to change to neutral good or chaotic neutral only, depending upon desire and or actions. From the absolute neutral alignment, one can only move to some neutral based alignment. This represents the fact that the character must divorce himself or herself from certain precepts and views and wholeheartedly embrace another set of values. And human nature is such that without radical personality alteration, such as caused by insanity or magic in the cause of the game, such transition must be gradual. It is assumed that the character's initial alignment has been his or her for a considerable period prior to the character's emergence as an adventure. This ethos will not be lightly changed by a stable, rational individual. It is recommended that you do not inform players of the penalty with which occur with alignment change, so that those who seek to use alignment as a means of furthering their own interests by conveniently swapping one for another when they deem the time is ripe will find that they have instead paid a stern price for fickleness. All right, that's the end of that section. Yeah, alignment change, I mean, why would you even, I don't understand why that would be an issue ever, to be honest, because you chose that alignment as the character in order to help define your character, right? <laughs> like, that's a part of who the character is, so why would you voluntarily change that? And why would a paladin travel with a thief in a party anyway, you know, or vice versa? Or an assassin that would be poisoning? It seems uh, you're setting yourself up for failure in that case of a, a campaign, you know, as players. And going back to the whole monster thing, I, I find it really interesting that this idea of a humanocentric campaign in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons completely was abandoned in modern gaming with even as early as arguably second, but specifically third edition, and then now fifth, where we have specific racial class characters that are monster oriented. And you can argue that Dragonlance did that with Draconians and making Draconians playable characters. But again, I don't think that was until third edition. So my point still stands there. I don't know. I've never been a big fan of having monster characters or that idea that you're touched by a dragon or touched by a demon so you get some of their powers. That's always seemed a little video gamey to me. And there was always a very clear distinction between video games and role-playing games. You know, role-playing games always being much more much more strict. And, and that's a strange idea too because video games you know, have set rules that you have to operate in. But still, they sort of give you these instant powers, whereas with role-playing games, you kind of have to earn those. So I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. Let's move on to the money section. About the money, Lebowski. Money. Player character starting money. The amount of funds with each player begins with is kept low to prevent the game from becoming too easy. Players learn from the beginning that they are never able to obtain all of the goods they would like in order to feel safe and satisfied. Explain to players that sums they begin with, see player's handbook, money, represent inherited monies and savings. A magic user, for example, has had to expend much ready cash he or she possessed on training. Monks are ascetics who don't care about material possessions in any event, so they do not accumulate much money prior to becoming adventurers and treasure seekers. If you have a difficult campaign and you opt to bestow a limited number of special items to player characters at the very beginning of the game, a potion, a magic goodie such as a plus one dagger, or even something as mundane as a family suit of plate mail, you should adjust starting money accordingly. The game is always supposed to be a challenge, to cause players to want for something and to wish to adventure with their characters in order to obtain the desired things. Remembering that good players will be able to gain from nearly any successful encounter, there will always be some armor and weapons or equipment to be gained from an adventure. You should not hesitate to be stingy and tight right from the beginning of a campaign. Player Character Expenses Each player character will automatically expend no less than 100 gold pieces per level of experience per month. This is simply 
support upkeep equipment and entertainment expense. These costs are to be deducted by the Dungeon Master automatically, and any further spending by the PC is to be added to these costs. Such expense is justified by the fact that adventures are a freewheeling and high-living lot, except, of course, for monks. Other miscellaneous expenditures by playing characters encompass such things as additional equipment expense for henchmen or hirelings, cost of hirelings, bribes, costs of locating prospective henchmen, and so on. Two such costs are to be added. Maintenance of henchmen, 100 gold pieces per level per month. Maintenance of stronghold, 1% of total cost of stronghold per month. This is in addition to all treasure shares. Finally, any taxation or other levies must be taken into consideration along with contributions to the player character's religious organization. All of these costs will help assure the PCs have kept a keen interest in going out and adventuring in order to support themselves and their many associates and holdings. You may reduce costs according to prevailing circumstances if you feel it is warranted, but even so doing should not give rise to excess funds on hand in the campaign. Value and reputed properties of gems and jewelry. Gems. The base value of gems found in a treasure can be determined in whole or in or by lots of five or ten stones by rolling percentile of dice. Then we have our little uh, gems table here. The die score, the base value, description, and then the size. We got a guy down here observing an opal or something. Value of a gem depends upon its type, quality, and weight. A huge semi-precious stone, carnelian for example, is worth as much as an average gemstone, quality being equal. Size may vary from stone to stone, a 50 gold piece ornamental stone being of above average size, while a 50 gold piece gemstone would most likely be very small. Increase or decrease of worth beyond base value. If you do not place specific value on each gem in a treasure, showing rather the base value for each gem instead, then variation in the worth of each stone should be allowed. This variation will generally result in some increase, although there is a chance for decreasing value as well. See below. To find if a gem increases in value, roll a d10 for each stone and consult the table below. And here's our little table. Your die roll and the result. When base value only is known, use the table above and roll for each stone. Stones for which a 1 or a 0 is rolled must be diced for, uh, for again on the table, but all others are excluded from such rolls. If large numbers of stones are in question, it is suggested that they be diced for in groups in order to make the process less time-consuming. Key to gem properties. Transparent is no notation. Translucent is in italics. Opaque is asterisk. Ornamental stones, base value. And what we have here is a, a series of tables uh, to tell you information about individual stones. And we go back to gemstones and jewelry. Jewelry. These base values of jewelry, jewelry is determined by percentile dice roll, just as with gems. Once jewelry's base value is determined, each piece should be checked for workmanship and design by rolling a 10-sided dice. Each one rolled indicates the piece of jewelry is question, in question is of exceptional value and thus either goes to the highest possible value in its class or to the next higher class, which its base value is redetermined and its workmanship and design are again rechecked. Any piece of jewelry set in the gems must also be checked for the possibility of an exceptional stone in the setting. Any score of one on an eight-sided die indicates that the value of the piece of jewelry increases by 5,000 gold pieces, and these exceptional pieces are further checked by rolling a six-sided die, each successive one doubling the increase, i.e. 10,000 gold piece, 20,000 gold piece, 40,000 gold piece, 80,000 gold piece, up to a maximum of 640,000 gold pieces. The Dungeon Master can, of course, name what each piece of jewelry is, bracelet, brooch, crown, earrings, necklace, pendant, ring, tiara, etc., giving it substance and the number and value of its stones. And then we have a nice little table here of reputed magical properties of gems. And uh, it gives you the gem type or color, 
and the reputed effect, which is kind of funny. But the, the details like this is why I love this first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, because they went incredible detail to give you as much information as possible, you know, based on just fancy or, you know, rumor or old wives' tales. It's great. I love it. Oh, I was not done. Sorry. <laughs> we have a lot more here. Just tons of different types of gems and stuff. Really great. And the effects of each. Note regarding the magical properties of gems, herbs, et al. Regardless of what quantities gems, herbs, and other substances are purported to possess, the mere possession of a score of a type of gem or a veil of some herb will convey absolutely no benefit of magical nature to the character concerned. These special qualities are given herein merely as information for Dungeon Master's use in devising special formula for potions, inks, etc. The information might also prove useful in other ways, particularly with regard to description of magic items, laboratories, and so on. Under no circumstances should you allow some player to convince you on the contrary. I love that. Values of other rare commodities, and we have a list here. Beaver, ermine, fox, marten, mink, muskrat, sable, and seal. And then the pelts, cost, trimming cost, caper, jacket cost, and coat cost. Yeah, you can really go into crazy detail with this stuff. My goodness. And then we have armor class and weapons. And we can see the chart here of armor type, bulk, weight, and base movement. Types of armor and encumbrance. Oh, this is a new section. Let me uh, update this. Barely fits. <laughs> All right. Types of armor and encumbrance. The encumbrance factor for armor does not consider weight alone. It also takes into account the distribution of the weight of the armor and the relative mobility of the individual wearing the protective material. Therefore, weights for armor shown below are adjusted weights, and base movement speed is likewise shown. Armor types. Banded mail is a layered armor with padding, light chain, and series of overlapping bands of armor in vulnerable areas. Weight is somewhat distributed. Chainmail is padded plus interlocking mesh armor covering the upper and lower body. Vulnerable areas have multiple thicknesses. Weight falls upon the shoulders and waist of the wearer. Chain, elfin, is a finely wrought suit of chain which is of thinner links but stronger metal. It is obtainable only from elven kind who do not sell it. Leather armor is shaped cure bouli. Leather hardened by immersion in boiling oil. Cuirass and shoulder pieces are softer shirt and leggings. Padded armor is heavily padded quilted coat and an additional soft leather jerkin and legs. Plate mail is light chain with pieces of plate, cuirass, shoulder plates, elbow and knee guards and greaves. Weight is well distributed. Plate armor is a full suit of plate which is no more weighty and a bit less bulky, considering what is known as field plate. If you allow such armor in your campaign, use the same weight, with a 9-inch movement base and a base armor class of 2, sans shield. Such armor would be expensive, see 2,000 gold pieces. Ringmail is relatively soft leather armor over padding. To the long coat of leather are sewn metal rings. This makes the coat rather heavy and bulky. Scale mail is armor similar to ring mail, but overlapping scales of metal are sewn to both coat and leggings, or as skirted coat is worn. As with chain, weight falls mainly on the wearer's shoulders and waist. Shield, large, includes such shields as large Viking round shields or the Norman kite shields. They are made of wood, covered with leather, and bordered with a soft iron banding at the edges. Shield, small is the typical kite and heater shields, or small round shields constructed as a large shield, or else made of metal, more rare by far. Shield, small, wooden, is the same as other shields, but it lacks the metal binding and reinforcement, so it will be more easily split. Splint mail consists of light chain, 
greaves, and a leather coat into which are laminated vertical pieces of plate with shoulder guards. Studded leather is leather armor to which have been fastened metal studs as additional protection, usually including an outer coat of fairly close-set studs, small plates. Helmets. It is assumed that an appropriate type of head armoring would be added to the suit of armor in order to allow uniform protection of the wearer. Wearing of a great helm adds the appropriate weight and restriction, uh, restricts vision to the front 60 degrees only, but it gives the head arm class 1. If a, head, uh, if a helmet is not worn, one blow in six will strike at the armor class 10. Wow. Arm class 10 head, unless the opponent is intelligent, in which case one blow in two will be aimed at the arm class 10 head. D6, 1 to 3 equals head blow. Magic armor. When magic armor is warm, ass a worn, assume that its properties allow movement at the next highest base rate and that weight is cut by 50%. There is no magical elven chainmail. Magic shields. Magic shields are no less weighty than their non-magical counterparts, but they are not they are non-bulky with respect to encumbrance. Shield use. A shield is basically a barrier between its wielder and his or her opponent. It is used to catch blows or missiles. It can also be used offensively to strike or push an opponent. The shield can be used fully only to the left or front of the right-handed individual. Attacks from the right flank or rear negate the benefits of a shield. Small shields. Bucklers and other small shields, which are basically held with one hand, are moved rapidly by the wielder, so they cover only a small area, so they are less effective by and large. Such shields are less cumbersome and fatiguing in employment, however, so no distinction is made between a small and normal-sized shield in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Large shields. Although a large shield, such as a Norman kite shield or a large Viking round shield, covers much more of the body, employing one of these shields is far more difficult, as they are cumbersome and fatiguing. Therefore, large shields are treated as but plus one to armor class rating without a shield. Optionally, you may allow them to add plus two to this armor class rating with respect to small, non-war, engine or giant hurled missiles. If you do so, however, be certain that you also keep full track of encumbrance. Dexterity Armor Class Bonus This bonus is in addition to that given by any other forms of protection. The type of armor worn by the character with a Dexterity Armor Class Bonus does not adversely affect this bonus, for it is assumed that his or her physical conditioning and training compensate otherwise. This is particularly applicable with regard to magic armor, which is assumed to possess an enchantment which makes it both light and flexible. The penalty for wearing armor is already subsumed in the defensive bonuses given for it, and if it were further to penalize the character by denying dexterity armor class adjustments, it would be totally invalid. Modifiers to dexterity armor class adjustment. Neither penalty nor bonus due to dexterity, the defensive adjustment, is considered when the character is subjected to the following attack forms. Attacks from the rear flank, rear or strikes from behind, where the character is virtually unable to see the attack coming. Large missiles, such as those hurled by a giant or some form of engine, where the trajectory and speed and size of the missile negate dexterity considerations. Magical attacks by spell, device, breath, weapon, gaze, etc. Note that defensive adjustments do apply to saving throws for these attack forms. Weapon types to hit. Adjust adjustment note. If you allow weapon type adjustments in your campaign, please be certain to remember that these adjustments are for weapons versus specific types of armor, not necessarily against actual armor class. In most cases, monsters not wearing armor will not have any weapon type adjustment allowed, as monster armor class in such cases pertains to the size, shape, agility, speed, and or magical nature of the creature. Not excluded from this, for example, would be an iron golem. However, monsters with horny or bone armor might be classed as plate mail if you so decide, but do so on a case-by-case -case basis. Naturally, monsters wearing armor will be subject to weapon type to hit adjustments. And that is the end of that section. Let me have a sip of coffee. It's still early, so I'm still <laughs> kind of trying to wake up.
I have nothing to do today, so I'm just kind of goofing around with some online stuff, you know. Hirelings. This is an aspect of the game I have never actually used, which, I don't know, may speak a lot to <laughs> my desire to keep things simple, because it always seemed kind of a pain to track extra stuff. But let's see what we got here. Hirelings. Standard hirelings. Most hirelings are dealt with under the section entitled Expert Hirelings. These which are typically employed at such time as the character in question has an established stronghold. Common, standard hirelings are basically the usual craftsmen or labor taken on by lower level player characters. Men at arms, soldiers of mercenary calling, are dealt with under Expert Hirelings, QV. Typical standard hirelings are, and we have a little list here, the basic occupation, the daily cost of it, and the monthly cost of hiring them. <coughs> Excuse me. Monthly rate assumes that the quarters are provided for the hiring and that those quarters can contain a bed and the like necessities. <coughs> Pardon, I don't know what's happening. Additional cost is 10% of the normal price of items fashioned by the hiring. Bearer Porter, these individuals are laborers who will carry whatever is directed. Each is able to carry up to 50 pounds individually, or double that with a carrying pole or a leader or a lot the like. Carpenter. This occupation assumes most woodworking jobs. A carpenter might be hired to secure a portal, fashion a chest, etc. Leather worker. This occupation is principally concerned with the fabrication of leather goods such as backpacks, belts, straps, horse tack, etc. Limner. These individuals do all sign painting, drawing of heraldic sit devices, etc. Link Boy. A Link Boy is a torch or lantern bearer. They're often youngsters, but mature men will also serve. Mason. Any stonework must be done by a mason, and this occupation subsumes plasters as well. Pack Handlers. These individuals are trained at loading, handling, and unloading beasts of burden, such as donkeys, mules, horses, etc. Tailor. This occupation makes and repairs clothing, bags, shield covers, etc. It also subhumes hatters. Teamster. Teamsters are basically drivers of carts and wagons. They will also load and unload their vehicle. They are expert animal handlers with respect to their particular specialty of draft animal only, i.e. horses, mules, oxen, or whatever. Valet, lackey. This occupation subsumes the various forms of body servants and messengers. Location of standard hirelings. In general, the various occupations represented here are common to most settlements of village size and above, although each and every village will not be likely to furnish each and every sort of common hireling. Towns and cities will have many available, and each sort will be found in an appropriate section or quarter of the city or town. Employment of Standard Hirelings This requires the location of the desired individual and the offer of work. If the employment is for only a few days, there will be no real difficulty in locating individuals to take on the job. If the offer is for long-term employment, only one in six will be willing to accept unless a small bonus is offered. A day's wage is too small, but double or treble that is sufficient to make three or six willing to take service. Duties. It is not practical to try to determine the time and expense necessary to accomplish everything possible for the scores of standard hirelings possible to employ, so each DM will have to decide. For example, assume that a player character hires a tailor to make plain blue cloaks for all of his or her henchmen. This will take only about one day per garment and cost the stated amount of money plus five copper pieces, 10% of the cost of a cloak, per cloak for materials. However, if some cloaks were to be fashioned of a material of unusual color, and have some device also sewed upon them, time and material costs would be at least double standard and probably more. Expert hirelings. If henchmen are defined as the associates, companions, and loyal, to some degree, followers of a player character, hirelings are the servitors, mercenaries, and employees of such player characters, and they too can have some degree of loyalty based on their accommodations, rate of uh, remuneration, and of treatment. Various hirelings of menial nature are assumed to come with the cost of maintaining a stronghold, thus 
Cooks, lackeys, stable boys, sweepers, and various servants are no concern to the player character. Guards and special hirelings are, however, and such persons must be located and enlisted by the PC or his or her NPC henchman. Location of Expert Hirelings Most expert hirelings can be found only in towns or cities, although some might be located in small communities, providing they are willing to pick up and relocate, of course. Employment is a matter of offer and acceptance, and each player character must do his or her own bargaining. The various types of hirelings listed below will generally be found in the appropriate section of the community, the Street of Smiths, Weapons Way, Armor's Alley, etc., or at cheap inns in the case of mercenary soldiers. Monthly Costs The cost of each type of expert hireling is shown on the list. This amount is based on all the associated expenditures, which go with the position, salary or wage, uniform or clothing, housing, food and sundry equipment used routinely by the hireling, exception. The cost does not include arms and armor of soldiers, and these items must be furnished to mercenaries over and above other costs. Certain other hirelings incur costs over and above the normal also when they engage in their occupations. These are indicated on the table by an asterisk. Expert Hirelings Table of Monthly Costs in Gold Pieces. So we can see every type of person that you can hire. I kind of want to... I, I'm kind of wanting to really run a, an Advanced Dungeons and Dragons campaign. You know, of course, set in Dragonlance. And just deal with, like, uh, hirelings and stuff. Because I just never have. It's just one of those things that's just never really come about in my gameplay. We've always had enough people that the Dungeon Master would tailor the adventure to the amount of players that were there. You know what I mean? So the asterisk here is, cost does not include all remuneration of or special fees, add 10% of the usual cost of items handled or made by these hirelings on a per-job basis. Hey, Derek. Um, I.e., an armor makes a suit of plate mail, which has a normal cost of 400 gold pieces, so 10% of that sum, 40 gold pieces, is added to the cost of maintaining the black blacksmith. Yeah, Derek, you and I are going to have to try all these different... Because <laughs> we're going to be... We do the, the D&D Adventure System. We're probably going to try the Saga System, if we're being honest. We've got to do AD&D, old school Dragonlance. And so maybe we'll also try, if you're into it, I certainly am, the XDM 2nd Edition that's coming out next year. Because I think that'll be a lot of fun. All right, description of occupations and professions. Alchemist. This profession handles the compounding of magical substances and the advantage of employing an alchemist as detailed under the section, Fabrication of Magic Items, Potions. Alchemists will only be found in the cities unless you specifically locate one elsewhere. It will require an offer of 10 to 100 gold pieces bonus money, plus a well-stocked laboratory, plus the assurance of not less than a full year of employment to attract one to service. Oh, that's awesome to hear, Derek. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to... It's nice to find uh, people who are willing to break with the, the current standard of the game, you know what I mean? So, you know, whether your game's Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or Saga, uh, Star Wars, you know, you always, people usually like only play the version that is out because they feel like that's just what you're supposed to do. And I've never understood that. I always figured, why not try it all and just play the version that you enjoy most? And that means that you're going to have a less of a pool, a smaller pool of players to play from. But it also means you're going to have more fun because it's what you like. And I think the only way that you can find out if you like it or not is to play it. <laughs> it sounds stupid, but it's just one of those things like, yeah, of course. You have to try it. It's like that stupid Coke commercial. You've got to try it first. Armor. This occupation cares for and manufactures armor and shields. One armor is always required for every 40 soldiers or fraction thereof in the employ of the player character. And only spare time can be spent on the manufacture of items i.e. that fraction of the normal month not spent caring for equipment of troops can be used to make armor, helmets, and or shields, prorating time according to the number of men. 0 is 100%, 1 to 5 is 85%, 6 to 10 is 70%, etc. This includes the armor and the apprentices, which are assumed to be present and cared for by the cost shown. A workroom and forge casting 310 to 400 gold pieces must be available for an armor, and the skill of the armor must be determined if armor is to be fashioned. And so they got a little bit of a, a 
table here. So I'm just going to show these two tables. So you can see the percentage roll and what you're making. If items are to be made, the following times are suggested for an armor and apprentices working exclusively, assuming a one week period in order to set the operation in motion before actual work begins. Armor is occupied for part of the month with caring for the equipment of troops must increase time proportionally. So you got how long it takes, what type of armor here. So you got asterisks. The first uh, one asterisk is requires the service of leather worker and facility to boil leather and oil. Two asterisks requires only the service of a tailor who will be occupied 30 days with the task. Three is as with leather armor and a tailor must be employed as well. Four equals requires the service of a woodworker and five requires the service of a leather work, work, uh, worker and a blacksmith. NB for leather worker, tailor and woodworker, C standard hirelings. Dwarven armors are twice as efficient, but cost three times as much, and they will not generally labor for anyone beyond one year of service. Gnomish armors are one and a half times more efficient than humans and cost twice as much. Dwarves add 25% skill level roll, gnomes 10%. Elven armors cost five times the normal rate, and they will fashion only normal chainmail for sale, but it is of highest quality and they make it in half the time a human would. I love the idea of hiring a gnomish armor in Dragonlands. So you're going to get the plate no matter what. You know, whatever you hire him to make, he's going to make. But because it's a gnome, it's going to have like added adjustments. It's going to be like Swiss army knife armor. <laughs> so you'll have like a mess kit built into the side that sometimes work and sometimes won't. Kind of reminds me of like Goonies and um, oh, what is his name? Short Round, I think. I'm going in memory here. And he has that, like, uh, what was it? It was a boxing glove at the end of a, a, a coil, a spring. So when he, like, opens his jacket, the boxing glove actually hits him half the time. I think that'd be hilarious. Just add a bit of levity to an otherwise serious adventure, you know? Blacksmith. There must be a blacksmith in any stronghold, and he or she assists... Uh, his or her assistants can care for the needs of up to 40 men or horses. Another smith is required for an additional 160 men or horses, or fraction thereof, besides the usual duties, horseshoes, nails, hinges, and miscellaneous bits and pieces. A hired smith can turn out some weaponry each month. Each must have a workroom with bellows and forge. It can make mashed potatoes. That'd be hilarious. Oh my gosh. So here's what a blacksmith can put together here. It slices, it dices, it julienne's fries. Dwarven smiths are three times more efficient and cost ten times as much. Gnomish smiths are twice as efficient and cost four times as much. Engineer architect. This profession deals with above-ground construction and fortification. In order to build any structure more complex than a single hut or barn, it is necessary to hire one. An engineer architect is paid for whole months of employment, even if the work is completed in less than a whole month. He or she also collects an additional fee equal to 10% of the total expenditure on the construction. The building site must be selected or approved by an architect engineer, or else there's a 75% chance the structure will collapse in 1 to 100 months. Wouldn't that suck? You don't ever go cheap on engineer architects here, people. <laughs> if you want your stronghold to stay up, don't do it. If you want your stronghold to be able to withstand a kender and a gnome flying it around, <laughs> like the uh, flying citadel in Legends. Can you imagine if you're the architect that, that put together the flying citadel, how proud would you be that it survived a, a gnome and a kender flying it and just landing it upside down too, by the way, <laughs> and then landing it in some random lord's land and abandoning it. And that dude's just like, what? You, you can't park that here. This is my house. What are you doing? He just doubles his real estate. Engineer artillerist. This profession deals with the construction and use of siege artillery, catapults, trebuchets, etc. No such engine can be made of properly used with, without the services of such an individual. If employment is for short term only, say a few months or less, then rates of pay and costs will be increased from 10 to 60%. Engineer sapper miner. 
All underground construction or tunneling, as well as siege operations, will require mining, countermining, siege equipment, picks, rams, sows, towers, etc., or trenches, ditches, parapets, and so forth, require the professional services of an engineer, sapper, miner. Dwarves are useful in this capacity of engineer miners only. They are twice as costly and add 20% to the efficiency of human miners. And dwarven miners will work only for a dwarven engineer miner, of course. Jeweler Gem Cutter This profession allows the character to have a rapid and accurate appraisal of any precious metal, gem material, or piece of jewelry, except those which you, as DM, specifically designate as heretofore unknown. In addition, the jeweler gem cutter can set stones and varying things of sword hilts, flagons, or whatever, or fashion jewelry from gem material and precious metals. A simple ring will take a week, a bracelet with sculpting two weeks, with stones set three. While a crown may require a full year of work. Basically, the work merely adds either splendor to the player character's personage by the display, or the total value of the materials can be increased by from 10 to 40%, depending on the skill of the individual doing the work. Likewise, as a gem cutter, the individual might wear, well increase the value of a rough or poorly cut stone, those under 5,000 gold pieces base value, or the stone might be ruined in the process. Note that jeweler gem cutters cannot be held responsible for damage. Both functions are shown below. So we've got the quality of both jeweler and gem cutter that my icon here <laughs> is sitting right in front of there. Gotta get out of my own way. Important. Players should never know the skill levels of a jeweler gem cutter. Well, that's weird. I suppose, like, the individual jeweler or gem cutter would always say that they're best. You never run across someone that's like, eh, I'm mediocre. But you can still hire me. <laughs> you know? Everyone's going to say they're the best. That kind of makes sense, I suppose. I would, however, allow any snooping player to, you know, roll versus... Uh, I don't know, bluffing or something like that. Dwarven gem, uh, jeweler gem cutters add 20% to skill level determination rolls. They cost twice as much to employ as far as gold piece outlay is concerned. Gnome jeweler gem cutters add nothing to jeweler's skill, but add 30% to gem cutter skill. They likewise cost double with regard to monthly wage. Mercenary soldier. The likelihood of encountering any given type of mercenary is strictly up to you as DM. A table shown below suggests probabilities as well as typical numbers. Types will seldom be mixed. If more than five are encountered, one will be a sergeant, a leader type or equivalent of a non-commissioned officer. It is urged that one sergeant for every ten troops be used as a minimum figure with regard to regular soldiers and leader types. Captains will have to be hired for each sort of troop type. Note that regular soldiers are zero-level men-at-arms with four to seven hit points each. And we got a bit of a table here. So we've got the type of soldier, you know, what they specialize in. And then you have your sergeant down here. Interesting. And we've got some definitions here. Archer, longbow. These troops will be able to operate as light infantry when not employing bows. They can use any typical weapon, for they must be strong and in good health. Archer, short bow. These troops will not fight as infantry when not using their bows unless it is a desperate situation. In extremis, they will fight as light infantry using short swords, hand axes, and similar weapons. You may desire to allow certain types, such as historical Viking warrior types, to be exceptional. If so, these individuals will certainly demand longbows wages. Artillerist. These troops are required to operate any missile engines larger than a heavy crossbow. They will fight as light infantry only in extremis. Captain. A captain is nothing more than a capable leader, a fighter of 5th, 6th, 7th, or 8th level, according to the D10 score. 1 through 4 equals 5th, 5 through 7 equals 6th, 8 through 9 equals 7th, 0 is 8th, but not capable of working upwards. A captain can command as many scores of troops as he or she has levels, i.e., 4th level enables commanders of 80 men, 5th level enables command of 100 men, etc., in addition, the level of the captain dictates the number of lieutenants, which can be controlled. This is exclusive of sergeants and any auxiliary types, such as servants, cooks, etc. The monthly cost of a captain is 100 gold pieces per level. Crossbowmen. These soldiers are able to use any sort of crossbow furnished. Each heavy crossbowman will typically desire a light infantryman to accompany him to act as a shield bearer. 
Crossbowmen will bear handheld weapons and fight as light foot if meleeed by enemy troops. Footmen heavy. These troops are trained to fight in close formation. They do so regardless of the type armor they are equipped with. Weaponry can be shield and sword, axe and shield, pole arms, etc. Footmen light. These soldiers do not fight in close formation. They are useful in rough terrain, woods, etc. Footmen pikemen. These soldiers are heavy foot, which are who, who I'm sorry, who are especially trained to fight with pikes and also maneuver with them. Mercenary pikemen will be high quality, not militia or levy quality. Heavy footmen can be placed in the center of a pike formation of 100 or more troops if these troops have trained for not less than two months with the pikemen. Hobelar. I don't even know what that is. Heavy or light. These troops are simply mounted infantry, able to use horses to move but not capable of mounted combat. Thus, Hobelars ride to battle, but dismount to fight. Some provision must be made to care for the horses, or the Hobelars will leave 25% of their number behind to do so. Horsemen Archer. These light troops are generally nomadic types, undisciplined and prone to looting. They will fight hand-to-hand -hand only if circumstances force this action upon them. They can wear leather, ring, or chainmail, and they can carry small shields for use when not plying their bows. Horsemen Crossbowmen. All such troops are armed with light crossbows, as heavy weapons are not usable on horseback. They are light troops, but they can wear any sort of armor. They will wear handheld weapons in combat if necessary. Horsemen Heavy. These soldiers are trained to operate in close formation, stirrup to stirrup. They are able to use most weapons common to horsemen. Horsemen Light. These troops are not trained to operate in close combat, uh, close order or formation. They are useful skirmish raider types only. Horsemen Medium. Similar to heavy cavalry, medium horsemen are trained to operate in formation, but they are generally smaller individuals on lighter horses and do not ride as close to their fellows. Lieutenant. A lieutenant, it, I can't help but think, Lieutenant Dan, Lieutenant Dan. All right. A lieutenant is an assistant to a captain or a leader in his or her own right. Fighter level is second, D10, score 1 to 7, or third, D10, score 8 to 10. And the lieutenant can command as many decades of troops as he or she has levels. This is exclusive of sergeants, of course. A lieutenant serving under a captain extends the number of troops the captain can effectively command and control. The level of a lieutenant determines how many sergeants he or she is able to direct. These, in addition to those normally serving with the troops, i.e. two or three additional sergeants, <laughs> sergeants, sergeants who can do special duty. The monthly cost of a lieutenant is 100 gold pieces per level. They cannot progress in level. Sapper Miner. These troops are required for any military operations which involve use of siege machinery, towers, trenches, mines, etc. Although they will fight only to preserve their lives, they do fight as heavy footmen. They normally wear only light armor because of their duties, leather or studded leather, if they are active. Sergeant. A sergeant is the leader of a small body of troops, a non-commissioned officer equivalent. All sergeants are first-level fighters, but incapable of progressing further. A sergeant could command up to ten soldiers as an independent unit, or assure orders from lieutenants or a captain are carried out. They must be one sergeant minimum for every ten regular soldiers, and there can be one per five. The monthly cost of a sergeant is ten times the rate of the troops he or she commands. So a sergeant of heavy horsemen costs sixty gold pieces, one of light footmen, only ten. Slinger. Slingers are trained from youth up, as are long bowmen, and are thus rarely encountered. They can wear leather, including studded leather, padded or ringmail only, but they are also able to employ small shields at the same time as they ply their slings. They are always light infantry, and they are always able to use only lesser handheld weapons, such as hand axes, clubs, short swords, and daggers. Non-Human Soldiers there can be various units of non-human troops available for mercenary duty, but this depends upon your milieu. It is suggested that, as a general rule, such troops be enlisted only when they are actually dwell, and only in the player character champions their cause or as a minion of their alignment, religion, or the like, or as a racial hero. The types of soldiers available depends entirely on the race. See Monster Manual for such information. The less intelligent non-humans will serve for from 10 to 60% less cost, but these evil creatures will certainly expect to loot, pillage, and rape freely at every chance, and kill and probably eat captives. 
dwarves will serve at double rates or a normal rates if they are basically aiding a companion of the cause and people. Gnomes and halflings will only serve in the latter case. Elves are a difficult case to handle, for they might serve against hated foes or for a cause, but in either event, probably for greater cost or special considerations only. Half-humans, such as half-elves and half-orcs, <laughs> orcs, might be f uh, found amongst either human contingents or with those of their non-human parent race. Possible non-human soldiers are bugbears. What? Half bugbear? I've never heard of that. Okay, anyway. Bugbears, dwarves, elves, gnolls. A half knoll. Gnomes, goblins, halflings, hobgoblins, kobolds, lizardmen, orcs. I can't even... I know like bugbears are just a, an offshoot of goblin. So, you know, same with hobgoblins. But... I've just never heard of a half bugbear. That's weird. Sage. Sages are a very special case indeed, for they are the encyclopedias, computers, expert opinions, and a sort of demi-oracles of the milieu all rolled into one. Even in a quasi-medieval fantasy world, the sum of human knowledge will be so great and so diverse as to make it totally impossible for any one sage to know more than a smattering amount of things. A fair understanding of their overall field and a thorough knowledge of the particular specialty or specialties. The general fields of study for sages are shown hereafter, with special areas of expertise listed under each general category. <laughs> Derek. I can imagine a pretty cute little stuffed animal, you know, or like a little bobblehead, but I don't know. I'm, I wouldn't trust. Maybe I'm racist against hobgoblins and bugbears, but I couldn't, I couldn't trust a half bugbear. Sage ability. While any sage is capable of carrying on a discussion in a field of knowledge, what he or she actually has expertise in is an entirely different matter. Thus, any given sage will know a general field of his or her chosen study well with expertise in two or more special areas. And in addition, he or she will be able to give reasonable advice in one or two other fields, but have absolutely no expertise in any of the special category of the other fields. Note that expertise in a limited number of special categories does not imply that the sage is limited in talent, only that he or she has devoted major effort into limited areas, and his or her knowledge of these special categories will be important for the DM to assume not only the role, but also the overview and personal dedication of the character. The number of fields of study, major and minor, and the specialization categories are determined by use of the two tables given hereafter finding the number of fields of study first. So let's take a look here. So we've got the minor fields and special categories and major fields based on the dice score. To use the above information on the following table, first roll four or choose one field of study to be the sage's major field, then choose the proper number of special categories within that field. Finally, roll or choose the indicated number of minor fields. So we've got our fields right here, sage fields of study and special knowledge categories. There's all sorts of stuff here, and that's, that's great. They really go into, de into detail. That's crazy. Ah, oh, here's my favorite part, the supernatural and unusual. <laughs> Reminds me of Beetlejuice. Okay, and the chance of knowing answers to a question is uh, based on percentages here. To use the above table, each time a particular question is asked, First, roll d10 or d20 as applicable to determine the sage's base percentage chance within the range shown to know the answer. When that is determined, roll to see if the sage does know the answer. Rolling the indicated base percentage or below indicates that the sage has the knowledge for that particular question. You must determine if any given question is of general, specific, or exacting nature according to the subject. For example, do giants live on that island? is a general sort of question. Do fire giants inhabit the volcanic region of that island is a specific question. And do fire giants inhabiting the volcanic region of that island possess the artifact of, oh, whoa, Alamanazalas <laughs> is exacting. Any question asked must be within the scope of knowledge of the player character or his or her associates at the time. And such inquiries must always be consistent with the learning of the milieu which you have designed. Thus, if you have no gunpowder in the milieu, 
no questions regarding that substance, no matter how phrased, would be possible, as none of the inquiring parties could possibly have any inkling that such a thing exists anywhere in the multiverse. Be certain to adhere to this rule strictly. Unless, of course, you run across Palin's son, Ulan? Is that it? Ulan? Where he invented gunpowder, <laughs> and then he buried the invention. And I would have to argue that wouldn't gnomes have come up with gunpowder before, like, the Fifth Age, right? Like, that just seems like something they would do. By accident, of course, but certainly they would have done. Knowledge of any sage character is not entirely contained within his or her brain, as with any scholar. Sages will tend to collect materials which pertain to the fields of study he or she pursues. Thus, the sage must have both living quarters as well as a study and library and workroom a minimum of four rooms of at least 200 square feet each, and if the sage is kept busy answering many questions, then he or she will need more space for the additional materials, books, equipment, life forms, etc., needed to fulfill the demands of the position. Okay, but if you have all the books, why do you need the sage? Right? <laughs> Am I the only one that thinks that? I I mean, if you can read, then it's just time in searching, right? No. Uh, as DM, make a point of asking for far more than is actually needed, as any dedicated scholar scientist will desire acquisition of absolutely everything needed or imagined to possess a virtual university and museum. A sage who specializes in flora, for example, might request a root cellar, greenhouse, fungi beds, several acres for growing various plants, all in addition to a bedchamber, study, library, and workroom. Yeah, you're right, Darth. You're right, time is money. Sage characteristics, as with any hireling of importance, abilities, alignment, and even special skills will have to be determined. Strength, D8 plus 7. Intelligence, D4 plus 14. Wisdom, D6 plus 12. Dexterity, standard, 3D6. Constitution, 2D6 plus 3. Charisma, 2D6 plus 2. Alignment, see below. And we have a bit of a table for choosing the alignment here. Hit points, 8 to 4, plus constitution bonus as applicable. Special skills. Man, these sages get tons of detail here. All sages will have some abilities with respect to spells, for their studies will have empowered them thus. Determine whether spell abilities will be magic user, illusionist, cleric, or druid by studies. Flora and fauna indicate druidical talents. Supernatural or unused indicates either magic user or illusionist ability. If magic user talent is not obviously indicated, assume illusionist only. Studies of the physical universe indicate clerical talents, as do such studies as most categories of human, demi-human, and humanoid nature, and art and music and legends and folklore being either clerical or magic user. When some natural bent is discovered, find the maximum level of the spells known to the sage by rolling a d4 plus 2 to find the level between 3 and 6 inclusive. This only indicates the ability to use spells of up to the level shown. It does not mean that the sage is able to use any spell in particular. Each sage will possess one to four spells of each level, but at any given time, he or she will have no more than one of each level ability for actual use uh, available. The rest being contained in various source books. Find specific spells by random generation. Spells such as bless, chant, prayer, commune, raise dead, commune with nature, and contact other planes or their reverse, if applicable, are not within the capabilities of a sage. Naturally, the sage will tend to keep his or her spell knowledge as highly secret, and he or she will likewise have those spells which seem applicable for activities likely to be pursued during the course of the period of the sage envisions. Abilities will change due to aging or special circumstances only. Sages will not increase in hit points, and their special abilities will not increase either. Although if they acquire magic items which are usable by characters of the same profession as that of the special abil spell ability, they will likely be able to use such items. Spell use is at a level equal to the minimum level at which such a spell could be employed if the sage were of that class, i.e. a sage with third level spell use in magic casts spells at fifth level of ability, the minimum level for a magic user to cast a third level spell. All sages are middle-aged to venerable in age. Hiring a sage. Only fighters, paladins, rangers, thieves, and assassins are able to hire a sage. Other classes of characters can consult them, however, as explained hereafter. 
Any character hiring a sage on a permanent basis must have a stronghold with ample space for the sage as noted above. A sage will accept services only on a permanent lifetime basis. Wow. Jeez, they really latch on to you. Location of a sage. Sages will be found only in large towns and cities. They are typically in or near colleges, schools, universities, libraries, museums, forums, and public speaking places. Sages belong to a brotherhood, but as a general rule, this association is informal and not likely to have a headquarters at which a sage could be located. However, the employment of a sage will become common knowledge to all sages within the area. Short-term employment of a sage. Upon locating a sage, any class of character can ask him or her uh, to question one or more, I'm sorry, to answer one or more questions. Such short-term employment cannot last beyond one week's time, and the sage will thereafter not be able available for at least one game month, as there are more important and constructive things to be done than answering foolish questions anyway. <laughs> Remembering the restriction regarding time, use the information found under the Information Discovery section hereafter. Cost for, cost for short-term employment are 100 gold pieces per day, plus the variable amount shown under Information Discovery, for question difficulty, reflecting costs of attaining research materials or for the information proper through free fees, bribery, donations, etc. I'm getting tongue tied here. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through the rest of this. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to. I'm going to try to get through uh, sages, and then I'm going to probably stop here. Um, if initial reaction of the sage is favorable to the player character attempting to hire him or her, the sage will then entertain any offers of employment on a permanent basis which the character chooses to proffer. As a sage will bring nothing save thinking ability and knowledge, an offer of employment must consider the following. And we have a little tiny table here of support and salary, research grants, initial material expenditure, etc. and the cost. Determine salary and grant expectations by random dice roll of 2d6 for each. Initial material expenditure is a far more important matter. For even if the sage is otherwise satisfied, if this is not met and exceeded, then the ability to answer specific and exacting questions will be sharply curtailed due to lack of reference works, experimental equipment, and so on. A 20,000 gold piece expenditure will allow the sage to operate at 50% of normal efficiency, and for each additional 1,000 gold pieces thereafter, the sage will add 1% to efficiency until 90% is reached upon expenditure of 60,000 gold pieces. After 90%, to achieve 100% efficiency, the cost is 1%, uh, I'm sorry, the cost per 1% is 4,000 gold pieces. For the obvious erudite and rare tomes, special supplies and equipment, etc., assuming such are available, of course. All total expenditures must be 100,000 gold pieces for 10% sage efficiency in specific and exacting question areas. Note, additional expenditure of materials will increase sage question answering ability in the general and specific areas as follows. For each 5,000 gold pieces and one month of uninterrupted study time, the sage can increase his or her knowledge outside his or her field of study by 1% to a maximum of 5%. At 10,000 gold pieces cost and one month's time, sage ability in minor fields of study can be brought up by 1%, subject likewise to a 5% maximum gain. Addition to another f minor field, three maximums, requires 100,000 gold pieces expenditure and two years of time. Addition of a major field of study requires 200,000 gold pieces and two years time. Payment must be made in advance. No questions can be asked of the sage during the stated period of time or all is lost. You know, in the example given about whether or not the specific giant with the specific item lives on said island, I would rather just go find out than wait two years for the sage to come back and tell you no. <laughs> it's kind of messed up. Information discovery. It will take only a relatively short period of time and no cost to speak of to discover information of a general nature, but as questions become more difficult, the time and cost to give an answer becomes a factor. This is shown in the following table. Let me show you this table here. 
information discovery time and cost and it gives you all the information here note all times assume that the sage will be in a position to conduct research and obtain necessary equipment within a day or two of the discovery of the need and the costs shown assume these activities if a town or city is not nearby double times and costs or compute the sojourn expenditure necessary to arrive at a locale where the needed materials are to be had and determine other expenses also however if the percentile dice score rolled for knowing the answer to the question is in the lower 20 percent of the spread then there will be no costs incurred as the material is on hand thus if a sage has a 31 percent to 40 percent chance of knowing a question and the dice indicate a 32 percent chance of knowing it a following roll of 32 percent or less indicates knowledge but a roll of 0.6% or less indicates that the sage has the information about the question available and thus will be no additional expense. Furthermore, in the special category of study, any spread with the lower 80% has no cost as this area is where the sage will have accumulated most of his or her materials. As DM, you may also use judgment as to related questions so that if a close, closely related query is made following one for each uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like stumbling because I've been reading for two hours now. Um, if a closely related query is made following one for which an expenditure was necessary, you must determine whether or not the further question or questions would be answerable for some material source which was formally obtained. Naturally, all costs are not for materials, some accruing as payments, fees, and bribes. You may likewise extend the time necessary to answer specific or exacting questions, which you believe that the sage would have had great difficulty answering due to lack of information available or particular nature of the question. For example, a query as to how the henchman of the player character could construct an artifact would never be able to be answered positively, but the sage might feel obligated to continue a fruitless search for the knowledge. Unknown information will always require from 51% to 100% of the maximum time shown to determine that the knowledge is beyond the ability of the sage. All costs will accrue at only half of the stated amount, however. Thus, suppose a sage is asked a question out of any of his or her fields of knowledge. If the question is of general nature, the sage will hedge and talk around the point, or just possibly sit and look wise for four to six rounds before answering that the question is beyond his or her learning and that there is no cost involved as a day was not spent researching. Were the question specific, he or she would require 13 to 24 days to discover that it was unanswerable and relate this to his or her employer or master. The cost would be 50 gold pieces per day or from 650 gold pieces to 1200 gold pieces. In this case, probably paid out to others as fees, stipends, and the like, trying to find someone with the answer. Rest and recuperation. After spending more than one day of time answering a question, a sage will need at least one day to rest and relax for every three he or she spent in research. During this time, he or she will not be able to answer any further queries of anything other than general nature. And if the player character bothers the sage often during this time off, the sage will demand from one to two additional days of time for special research. And until such time is granted, the sage will explain expend the maximum amounts of time and expense in answering questions. Non-human or part-human sages. Most sages will be human, but if your campaign milieu seems right for sages of dwarven, elven, or any other such race, feel free to use them. However, old and venerable category non-human sages will not be likely to be interested in employment with humans. Just as human sages will tend to favor employment with humans unless their specialization dictates differently. And that is finally the end of the sages portion. My goodness. And that's going to be where I stop today's episode of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, what do you guys think about henchlings? Do you think uh, you should include poisons in all of your campaigns? Or do you think you should reserve it for special situations? And uh, do you let your player thieves roll for their thief abilities or do you as a dm take that upon yourself as is recommended in this dungeon master's guide let me know in the comments below uh, i appreciate you guys' time and attention i'm able to create these weekly videos because of it so if you're not already a member of this youtube channel i'd like to invite you to consider becoming one and if you'd like to pick up any edition of dragon gaming materials feel free to use my affiliate link in the description and just as a general note 
I, uh, this morning I recorded a reading of the original short story, Test of the Twins, that was found in Dungeon Magazine in 1984. That was an introduction, introduction to Dragonlance for the first time ever. And uh, it's a really interesting read. It's different than what you might think, and it's definitely different than the version that was released in the Magic of Kryn anthology, The Tales Volume 1. But that's only available to members of this channel, specifically the Heroes of the Lance tier, or level as they refer to it, I believe. So um, that is out there as an incentive, and uh, I'm going to continue creating videos like that and content like that, only able, uh, available to members as an incentive, and just a bonus of me saying thank you for your membership. You know, I, I, I do genuinely appreciate it. Doing stuff like this does take a lot of time, and, you know, like those sages, it can be uh, exhaustive. So, uh, you know, seeing other people's appreciation of that, well, it feels good, you know. It's really, it's really great. So anyway, that's all I have for today. I hope you guys have a fantastic day. Until next time, Salon Javar.